All right, topic eight, text structure and purpose. This is one of the most important skills that will show up on your SAT. Guaranteed, these questions will be on there. There's only two question types, and I guarantee you there will at least be one or two of these questions on that exam. So question types here, we have which choice best describes the overall structure of the text. This is almost word for word on every SAT. They don't really change the structure of this question at all. Now they also have which choice best describes the function of the underlined portion in the text as a whole. And this is also word for word on a lot of SATs. We're going to split this up into two different methods. So let's look at the method for step for this first question here. So the first thing is you read the answer choices, then the passage. Why is this? Because when you're looking at a problem like this, right? What you need to know is how the entire function, how every sentence essentially in the entire passage is functioning. Now, passages in the SAT can be no longer than 150 words. These ones are pretty close to that limit often. Okay. Now, once you read the passage after you're done reading the answer choices, you want to generalize each sentence. Okay. Generalize each sentence, make it like one or two word summary. So you can kind of look back at the answer and choices and reference them like, does this match what I'm seeing here? What am I seeing? And this might seem a little abstract, but we're going to go over an example question in a second that should make this pretty simple. Okay, then after you do that, you're going to match your one word descriptions to the answer choices. And that's pretty simple. Now we're also going to go over one little technicality here. If you have a question that asks for the purpose, the purpose is the why. Okay, why is the author writing this? What reason does the author have of giving this to you, giving this information to you? Why is this author including this sentence or that sentence or whatever? The structure is the how. How is the author working to convince you of something? How is the author telling their story? All right. So let's look at an example question here. Studies of consumer behavior re reveal that in the minds of consumers, prices never exist in a vacuum. Okay. I'm going to go back and read the answer choices now. So which choice best describes the structure of the test? text? We know that it's going to be one of these problems here. It's the exact same wording. So A, it presents a study of consumer behavior then critiques the methods used to conduct the study. B, it outlines an experiment and it provides details. And again, you're going to see a lot of these keywords when you do one of these questions. So I'm just going to kind of underline the keywords here. So it presents a study, then it critiques the methods. It outlines an experiment, then it provides details. It introduces an argument, then describes an attempt to alter that. It states a finding, then provides an example. Let's read the, let's read the passage here. Studies of consumer behavior reveal that in the minds of consumers, prices never exist in a vacuum. There is no price, no matter how low. That is always reasonable because consumers always measure current prices versus historical ones and against prices of other goods. We might think that 10 cents, which is a quantity of money that most of us have mindlessly lost between couch cushion sheets or on the sidewalk, is always expendable. And it is when assigned to an item that normally costs $2 like a candy bar but charge 10 cents at checkout for a single-use plastic grocery bag, an item for which consumers are not accustomed to paying directly, and studies show that c consumers are repelled, refusing the bags about half the time rather than spending their dimes. So, let me kind of characterize this in the one-sentence method. So here, I would kind of just call this a topic sentence, right? That's like two words, but it's fine. So let's call this topic sentence. All right, it could also be, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, if you were to think of a word here, right? What it's saying is it's kind of giving a little bit of a claim or a fact or just basically a statement. Now we might think, okay, what, do, what is this sentence really doing? This is kind of providing you with an argument, I would say, right? Maybe an argument because it's saying that it's always expendable. We might think maybe it's not. The author is going to introduce that maybe it's not, right? And it is, maybe. So let's say this This one I would say is kind of a short sentence. It's not really, it's kind of part of this one, so I'm not going to assign a new word. Okay. And then it says, but charge 10 cents at a checkout for a single-use plastic grocery bag, and studies will show that consumers are repelled. This is an example. This is pretty simple. So I'm going to go back and look at my answer choices again. Let's try to match this up. So it's not presenting a study. That's definitely not true. It's not critique, critiquing any methods used to conduct that study. So it's definitely not A. It's outlining experiment. No, there's no experiment that we have outlined here. Okay. There's definitely no procedure outlined. It introduces an argument. Well, maybe. But it definitely does not describe an, an attempt to alter those habits. We don't see that here. Say it's a finding. 
states. Well, we had the word statement up here, right? I kind of said the word statement. It's a topic, it's a claim, it's a fact. That's what we're starting off with. Then it provides an example. Have that here for sure, demonstrating that finding. So we can just see it's D. And that's how you'd want to solve one of those problems. Now let's take a look at a different problem, right? Kind of similar. Which choice best describes the function of the underlying sentence as a whole? So the first thing you read here is you read the answer choices, then you read the sentence, okay? You just read the sentence, and then you read the surrounding sentences. So we're going back to the sentence sandwich, okay? And then we're going to do we're going to do it in one word, all right? We're going to describe our sentence sandwich. So each of these words is going to have one sentence description. Our sentence sandwich is the sentence before, the underlying sentence, and the sentence after. Let's take a look at this question from the lightning rod man. The standard, the stranger still stood in the exact middle of the cottage where he had first planted himself. Okay. I was just kind of introducing it. Now we're going to take a look at our answer choices here. So which choice, blah, 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 blah. We know what the answer, what the, what the question's asking here. So it sets up the character description presented in the sentence that follow. It establishes a contrast with the description in the previous sentence. It elaborates on the previous sentence's description of the character. It introduces the setting that is described in the sentences that follow. So, first sentence, a stranger still stood in the exact middle of the college where he had first planted himself. Okay, that's kind of just like a description, I guess. His singularity impelled a closer scrutiny. A lean, gloomy figure. This is kind of short, so we're going to kind of extend our sentence sandwich, okay? Because we see that this could be a comma and this, all right, it could be some other form of, of linking phrases here and that kind of work. Hot hair dark and lank, maddedly streaked over his brow. His sunken pitfalls of eyes were ringed by indigo halos and played with an innocuous sort of lightning, the gleam without the bolt. The whole man was dripping. He stood in a puddle on the bare oak floor, his strange walking stick vertically resting at his side. So let's try to characterize our sentence sandwich here. So this is a description, right? This is just a description. It's further description. This is kind of introducing that description, right? It's an introduction. It's a why. Right, his singular, what is impelling this description? Why are we having this description? Because of a singularity. In the sentence before, it's kind of just introducing us, all right? It's kind of just context. Where is he? What's he doing? What's, where's he at, right? So I would say immediately, this is A. This is our why. It's impelling a closer, closer scrutiny, and it's leading to this, this whole rest of the passage, which is our character description. There's no contrast. He hasn't moved. He hasn't done anything. There's no description of the character really here. He's in the middle of the college. He, in the middle of the cottage, he's a stranger. That's pretty much it. It's not really elaborating on that. It's kind of more elaborating on his looks at this point, right? Introduce the setting. Not true. That's the first sentence. And that is how you would solve any sort of text structure and purpose question.